Okay, good morning. Welcome to Physical Science, May 4th, 2015. Today we're going to do an introduction to ionic bonding. Let's talk about our objectives. We're going to use prior knowledge to define terms we, um, we will build upon in this unit. That's our first priority. Our second priority is to apply our prior knowledge of the atomic structure and the balance of charges to distinguish ions, charged particles, from isotopes and neutral atoms of elements. The next thing we're going to do is utilize the Lewis dot structure of an atom to show the number of valence electrons. And then we're going to identify metals, nonmetals, and metalloids based on their position in the periodic table. So some review terms that are going to come up in this particular uh, section today are element, compound, isotope, atom, proton, positive, electron, negative, neutral, charged, valence electron, energy level or orbitals, neutron, noble gas, metal, nonmetal, reactivity, group A elements, and group, and group number. These are all review terms. Some of them we haven't used a whole lot, like uh, orbitals. We haven't seen that probably since February, but um, we've had these all before. Our new terms today will be um, ion, that's not really new to us, and Lewis dot structure. All right, so our first agenda, let's make sure everybody's done the warm-up. I'll read it, and then if the teachers need to pause for a moment to make sure we're all in good shape, that's great. You should have out your homework that was due today. That was section three on particles in a solution and section four on dissolving with water. Um, those two reinforcement sheets, you should have those out and they should be collected by the teacher. You also should have picked up the handout on the side table, which is the note sheets that look like this, and you should have a pencil out. If we need to pause to collect those materials and make sure the students have everything we need, please do so now. Okay, so we paused the video if we needed. Everybody's got their homework turned in so that we get a credit for it, their names were on it, et cetera, and then we picked up the handout and we have our pencil and we're all on this same slide looking at the agenda. So we're going to do a quick term review where you um, fill in your, uh, your vocabulary words. Then we're going to talk about the types of the elements, metals, nonmetals, metalloids, and then we're going to look at how to draw a Lewis dot structure, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the basic ionic compound. At the end, we have a graded warm-up that you, I'm sorry, graded wrap-up that you're going to do. And that will be collected at the end of the period. As long as we're productive, if you need more time, we'll collect at the beginning of class tomorrow. There should be enough time to finish everything, but it just depends on whether or not we stay focused and on task. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So here's the first slide. And you'll notice that I've got a definition missing, and then some vocab terms missing. And then for compound, I want you to get a couple of examples. We've done tons of these. I want to pause the slideshow here for maybe about three or four minutes, give students a chance to fill in their vocabulary terms, fill in the definition for atom, and fill in a compound. So go ahead and pause the video here, and then we'll come back and go over it together. Okay, so you should have paused the video here, and then hopefully you remember that an atom is the smallest unit of matter which is chemically unique. We had said all elements can be broken down into individual atoms, but we can't get down any smaller than that to be um, uniquely identified. And we had talked about an atom of an element is identified by the number of protons, and that number is unique to each element. So it says a substance which can't be broken into simpler substances which is identified by the number of protons. Well, I kind of gave it away in the other one, right, with our example. That's an element. For a compound, it's two or more elements chemically bonded together. And so whatever examples you put here is fine. The most common ones we've been dealing with are water, sodium chloride, carbon dioxide. Maybe you picked up carbon monoxide, CO, or maybe you picked up hydrochloric acid from our most recent unit, HCl, or perhaps you caught something really fancy like sodium hydroxide or potassium sulfate. 
some of the ones we were working on on the more recent worksheets where we were dealing with solubility. Those are all compounds. There are two or more elements bound together. Our next term, atoms of an element which have different number of neutrons in the nucleus. Well, that's an isotope. And this notation over here should have helped you remember that. Remember, these were all hydrogens, but this had no neutrons. This had one neutron that had two neutrons. Positively charged subatomic particle found in the nucleus of the atom. That's a proton. It has the same mass as a neutron, same amount of charge as an electron. So that should have helped you also identify it. A negatively charged subatomic particle found orbiting outside the nucleus. Negative charge, that's our electron, 2,000 times smaller, right? So the, the example should have helped you with this too, but you should be familiar with these terms. Neutrally charged subatomic particle found in the nucleus is my neutron, okay? All right, and these we talked about can start breaking down when we have nuclear decay. All right, so let's look at the next one again. Pause here. There's only four terms, so why don't we pause for like a minute or two and go ahead and fill in those terms. Okay, so now that we've paused the video and given students a chance to, to define Sorry, fill in the vocab term. An atom or object which has a shortage or excess of electrons, that's called charge. We said that we could count the protons and electrons, and if they weren't the same, then we knew we were charged. But the electrons are the one that move. All right, an atom or object which has more protons than electrons. And this can sometimes be called, called a cation. So that's our positively charged object. Sorry, I don't, the pop-ups are because I'm here late. Um, positively charged atom. All right, an atom or object which has more electrons than protons it can be called an anion. That one's our negatively charged. Okay, now we talked about getting positively charged and negatively charged particles when we did nuclear decay. Now we're going to start looking in this unit on how individual atoms transfer electrons from their orbitals to create a stable electron configuration. In nuclear decay, we talked about the stability of the nucleus. In this unit, the nucleus isn't going to change at all. We're going to look at the electrons on the outside of the nucleus which are moving around. And that's what's going to cause our positively and negatively charged atoms. Okay? An atom that has an equal number of protons and electrons is called neutral. It has no charge. Neutral charge. Neutrally charged, neutral charge, neutral atom. All the same thing. All right, let's go on. So I've placed this illustration in your note sheet to help you remember. We've talked about ions before. We said if I, remember that only the electrons move, not the protons. So if I give up an electron, if I get rid of my electrons, so here's an example here, lithium should have three protons, that's lithium, and it should have three electrons. This one only has two, so it has more protons than electrons. That's a positive thing. It gave up its negativity, and so this is a cation. And then if it gains, if it gets our electrons, right, we're getting all that negativity in, then I have more electrons than protons, and that's a negative thing, and so we call it an anion. And so um, here's an example for fluorine. Fluorine has nine protons. It should have nine electrons. You see I have ten here, two, four, six, eight, ten, ten electrons. So I have more electrons than protons. So I'm negatively charged, I'm an anion. All right. Now here are some new terms. Here are some new vocabulary terms. I've filled everything out in your note sheet, but if you need to, you can jot some extra notes in the margin. So our Bohr model is a term that we aren't going to deal with a whole lot right this minute. We're going to come back to it when we do covalent bonding. But a Bohr model is just a way of showing the atom and the electrons around the nucleus. 
We had talked briefly about this when we dealt with the models. Remember Democritus and the solid sphere and Thompson and the bread pudding model. And then, then we talked about Bohr and his um, electron configuration. And it looked like this, little shells of uh, our orbitals where our electrons were housed. And that's what our electron configuration was. It gives us a general location. This is based on the Bohr model. This particular diagram is not an accurate Bohr model, but it gives you an idea. Our energy levels are our possible locations where we're going to find our, our electrons. And we've called them orbitals, just like anything else. Um, but I did mention that if you take a full-fledged chemistry class, you'll really look at the shape of these things, and they get rather complicated. And I've given you an illustration here. Valence electrons is a very important term. I'm just going to put a big old asterisk here, highlight here. This one is very important. These are the electrons in the highest energy level. So notice that here's the nucleus with my protons and my neutrons right here under my example tool. And then here's an orbital with two electrons. And then here's another orbital with four electrons. These four electrons are the valence electrons. They're the outermost energy level. In this diagram up here by the electron configuration, you'll see it has more. Here's one orbital, there's two orbitals, here's three orbitals, and then in this outermost energy level, there's only two electrons. So this particular atom only has two valence electrons. This one has four. We'll talk about how we know that in a little bit. Okay. So a valence shell is just that location for the outermost uh, energy level. So it's kind of the name of the orbital. It's called the valence shell. So in the outermost orbital, called the valence shell, we will find the valence electrons or outermost electrons. I'm going to say that one more time. You can jot it down in the margin if you want um, or just kind of remember it. The valence shell is the outermost orbital where we find our valence electrons, the outermost electrons. Okay, so if we need to pause for a minute and have students discuss the uh, vocabulary so it makes sense, jot down any additional notes that you do, go ahead and pause the video here for a minute and take a time to kind of make sure everybody's good with these terms. Okay, so we should have paused to recap those vocabulary terms and make sure everybody is really comfortable with them. Now we're going to go back to a term of reactivity. And reactivity is a property that describes how readily a substance combines chemically with other substances. I put this note sheet pretty much complete in your notes so you can kind of follow along with me. Remember, we talked about things that were really reactive being explosive or they burned readily or they gave off heat or light or, you know, they bonded really quickly together, those things were reactive. So the thing that controls the reactivity of one element to another is the electrons, specifically those valence electrons, those outermost electrons, they're sort of the stickiness of that uh, element with anything else, that atom with anything else. We can think of it kind of like Velcro. So Velcro has two pieces. Velcro has a fuzzy piece like this that yeah, pretty much it sticks to stuff, but not really a lot, kind of that smoother side of the Velcro. Then you have the side with the really stiff, um, really stiff hairs. And man, that stuff sticks to everything. It'll catch on any other piece of clothing you have. If you're walking by something, it catches on everything. So this one's really, really sticky. And, but when we put them together, they're a perfect match. And you might want to jot these notes down on your the smooth side of the Velcro. It sticks, but not really to everything. The um, hairy side that's really firm, that catches on everything. And then, but when they're together, they, they bond up nicely. So this side of the Velcro represents things that have enough electrons that, yeah, they, they could use something, but they're not overly, you know, pushed to kind of get stuff. This one is something that has 
either just enough electrons to be settled or it just has just too many, just too many electrons to be uh, uh, really happy. And so it catches on everything. It'll react with everything. And we'll talk about that. We looked at it before. We said that the reactivity of the metals increases as you go to the left and to down. So francium is the, a very reactive metal down here in the corner. And what we didn't talk about is nonmetals. And nonmetals are reactive as you go to the right and up. So fluorine is one of the most reactive nonmetals. So take a moment and make sure you have sort of jot down your notes of whatever you need to for this one. So you remember that fluorine is that most reactive um, nonmetal. My noble gases, notice they're not there. My noble gases don't react with anything. Um, they are nonmetals, but they are not reactive. My, again, my, um, let me just type that up here so that we get that in our notes. Noble gases, last column. Not reactive. Still on it's still a non-metal, but they're not reactive. So you might want to put that in your notes, and then make sure also that you, you know, kind of highlight that this is the most reactive non-metal, and this is the most reactive metal. Okay. All right. Pause the video if you need to. Make sure everybody gets their notes up to date. All right, so let's go over the last set of vocabulary terms that we have for um, sort of review. And we've talked about, uh, oh, actually, this isn't the last step, but almost last step. So noble gases, the last column in the periodic table. And just draw an, you know, an arrow here to that one. I'm going to highlight it, but you, you don't have to. Those are your noble gases. And then my metals, remember, my metals are all these guys over here. All of these guys over here. Underneath the stairwell, remember this stairwell? I'm going to do this one like this. Those are our metalloids. Oopsie. Our metalloids are these guys in here. Boron, silicon, germanium, acetine, uh, don't remember what SB is. Um, tellurium, selenium. No, I don't remember what SB is. Uh, tellurium and palladium. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, and astatine. Sorry, it, these are our um, metalloids. And then, um, and then you have our nonmetals. And our nonmetals are these guys right in here. Now, remember that the noble gases are nonmetal, but they're not reactive. So we kind of have to keep them in our mind that we are nonmetal, but not reactive. Oh, and I forgot hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is also a nonmetal. Remember, that guy's on that left hand side, but we breathe it in all the time, nonmetal. So you don't have to color your periodic table. You'll have one later that you color. Um, but make sure you've got the arrows down so you see where things go. Also, don't forget that um, the actinide and lanthanide series are part of your metal groups as well because they go in right here on the periodic table. Okay, if we need a second here to make sure our lines are all drawn, drawn, go ahead and do that. And then go on to this one and pause for a moment to let the students fill in the vocabulary terms. They should already know these. Again, we pause for a moment to write in our vocabulary terms for these are elements to the left of the transition metals and to the uh, right are our group A elements. Those are the tall guys. So our group A elements were these columns here that are up top. Remember we had um, 18 columns that we looked at um, and these guys were our group A elements. And we can just write here, you can write group B. Group B. Okay. So then we looked at the next one. It says the number which identifies the column. That's called our group number. No big deal on there. Originally we had gone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 
12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 18 groups. We had numbered them before. The number at the top of the column was our group number. And then our group B elements are those transition metals. Those are the low case um, ones right down here. Now, I want to point something out. Our group A numbers, we now have um, slightly different numbers for them. On your little insert here, you should kind of barely see that they have things numbered. I'm not going to worry about numbering the group B, but let's number these group A since we'll need these numbers later. So this first column is 1A, or you could just put a, a 1 up there, 2A, 3A, 4A. We're not going to use Roman numerals because it just makes things confusing and we don't need them. 4A, 5A, that nitrogen column, 6A for oxygen column, 7A for our fluorine column, and 8A for helium. So take a moment and make sure that your group A elements are labeled with the group A group numbers. Notice these were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 before. Because we're separating them into A and B, we can get rid of those teens and just use these numbers, and that's going to help us with our valence electrons. All right. So let's talk about how to draw a Lewis dot diagram. So a Lewis dot diagram is going to show us the valence electrons around our um, elements. So we're going to practice first with lithium. So our first step is to write down the element symbol. So let's go back to our periodic table here. And there's lithium right there. And right here, number three um, on our periodic table is number three right here. And so we're going to go back, that's capital L, capital L. I'm going to change the background on here to help you a little bit. So LI, capital L, lowercase i, that's our symbol for lithium. Then it says, find the element in the periodic table and identify what group that's in. Well, it's in group 1A. So that tells us that there's one valence electron. And before we put the electron, we have to think about kind of the sides here that we have. So you have four sides to your letter. You have a top side a right side, a bottom side, and a left side. So we're going to use that to structure how we put our dots on. So when we put our dot, we're just going to put it on one side. So let me do a green dot here. So there it is, lithium, Li with one dot. Now you could put the dot here, or you could put the dot here, or you could put the dot here. or you could put the dot here. It doesn't make any difference. The only thing that's really important is that you have the element symbol and only one dot. So let's try this again. So let's look at sodium. So our first step is to go back to the periodic table. Let's go back to the periodic table. We look for sodium. Sodium's right there. N-A, sodium, N-A. So we're going to go here and we're going to type, or you're going to write, sodium, Na, our element symbol. And then we're going to go back here and we're going to look again and we're going to see that it's in group 1. So we should put how many dots, class? How many dots? One dot. Good. Again, it doesn't matter where it is as long as it's along one side. Okay. Now I want you to pause the video and do carbon. Do carbon. And then we're going to talk about carbon. Okay, so you should have paused the video and everybody should have done carbon. And carbon element symbol is capital C and it has four dots. Now, we're going to do something interesting with the four dots. You may have just kind of put them in all kinds of crazy places. I want you to fix it if you did. You're actually going to put one on each side. So there's one, here's another, here's another, here's my last one. So I'm going to put one on each side. So our electrons won't pair up. You notice there's only space really for about eight of these guys around here. 
and that's important. We'll get to that in a minute. But they won't start to pair up until each of these spaces are kind of filled. So I want you to practice doing that. So if I had more electrons, if I have a fifth one, then I go here. Then six, then seven, then eight, whatever. But they don't pair up. You put one on each side and then go back and fill in. So pause the video and do chlorine. Okay, so we should have paused the video and done chlorine. Some of you are having issues with chlorine. It's C, capital C, lowercase l, not CI, not carbon and iodine. It's chlorine C, capital C, lowercase i. Okay, so you went to chlorine. It was in group seven, so you had seven electrons. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. Notice that I'm nice and paired around my thing and then I have an empty spot, okay? Pause and do neon. Okay, so we paused and did neon. We found neon was capital N, lowercase e, and we have eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go, eight. Nice and neat. All right, now. Eight is a really important number, and in fact, I want you to write it right down here. Eight is great. Things want to have eight valence electrons. That makes them nice and stable. So lithium, ideally, would like to get seven. We're going to talk about how that doesn't happen. And sodium would really like seven more. And carbon would really like four more. It has four empty holes. And chlorine would really like one more. But neon, neon has everything it needs. It has all its sides filled with two electrons each. That's perfect. That's what we call the octet rule. Eight is great. There's an exception, except hydrogen and helium, then two is just fine. Pause the video, make sure you get this down. Hydrogen and helium only has space for two electrons in that first orbital, so it doesn't ever, neither of those will ever have eight. Two is all it needs, so you have to kind of remember that. Pause the video and get this down. Okay, so we should have had that straight. Now let's look at um, some notes about Lewis dot diagram. It's also called a Lewis, an electron dot diagram. This is important because you'll see these terms used interchangeably. It shows only the valence electrons around the symbol. Not all of them. It's very convenient for looking at rea reactivity of our elements. It helps us quickly see how reactive it'll be. And note that the group number tells us valence electrons, not the total number of electrons. Remember that the total number of electrons is generally equal to the total number of protons. At least to start with, we're going to start moving them around. So our group 1A has one valence, 2A has two, 3A has three, 4A has four, and so on. Except for helium. Helium is in eight but it only has two valence electrons. That's all it needs, that's all it wants. Remember our eight is great octet rule, except for hydrogen and helium and two's just fine. So you're gonna draw a whole bunch of dot, electron dot structures over the next week or so. I'm gonna show you this chart really quick just to point out a couple of things. You do not need to write this down because it's really easy to follow. Notice in group one, every single dot structure, every single element only has one dot. Group two, they all have two dots. Group four, they all have four dots. Group seven, they all have seven dots. Group eight, they have eight dots except for helium, which only has two. Okay, so you don't need to draw this down. You just really need to remember that the group number tells you your valence electrons, and then you've got it made. All right. Let's take a little bit of notes on ionic compounds. So, ionic compounds are compounds made with one metal and one or more nonmetal. Again, 
Ionic compounds are compounds made with one metal and one or more non-metal. I see the little lines underneath the rate I'll fill those in. In the chemical formula, the element symbol for the metal will always be written first. In a chemical formula, the element symbol for the metal will always be written first. When we have only two elements bound together, a metal and a non-metal, the compound is called a binary ionic compound binary ionic compound. When we have three or more elements bound together, a metal and two or more non-metals, the compound is called a ternary or tertiary ionic compound. If you need to pause the video here for a minute, go ahead to write down ternary or tertiary ionic compound. So I want to point out here, see the number two here? Remember the prefix by? That's a prefix means two. It's another prefix for two. And up here, you have three. Well, you're used to probably seeing tri for a prefix for three. But T-E-R is also another prefix for three. And that doesn't limit it to three, but ter means three or more. You could have more, okay? Three or more. Sorry, uh, two, two or more. Three items. Sorry, there's three. Notice there's two items here, metal and non-metal. I hope I didn't confuse people. Here, there's three. There's a metal and two non-metals. That's three or more. That's where the, uh, the three prefix comes from, okay? When the metal and non-metal bond together, there is a transfer of electrons. The metal gives up electrons to the non-metal. So back to those givers and getters. Okay, so at this point, we have gone through all the notes we need to for today. Um, and you have a practice packet. Is the, the, sorry, practice sheet is the last sheet in your packet. It says graded wrap-up. This is the one that I want you to do. The teachers have periodic table, I'm sorry, colored pencils to color the periodic table. And then on the back, you've got a few questions that you need to answer. This should be done by the end of the period today. But if you need more time, that's fine. Beginning of class tomorrow, as long as we're productive. All right. Good job. Thank you.